What's up, everybody? It's your boy, Brandon, back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. But first, before we get started, a little disclaimer. I am not a financial advisor, and the guest is not giving financial advice. So everything you hear on this podcast is strictly opinion and should not be taken as financial advice. We disclose if we have any holdings discussed in this podcast, and you should not be following us as financial advisors. You should discuss this with professionals before you get involved or invested. And as always, it's not financial advice. So please, please, please take this strictly as our opinions and for entertainment purposes only. Now let's get into the show. What's up, everybody? I'm back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. But first, I'd like to thank my sponsor, Inverse. Inverse is a social and collaborative investment research platform. Many new companies like Robinhood have increased the access to financial markets. Well, Inverse is increasing the access to high quality investment research and discussion. The entire platform is built around top notch data and tools to help you analyze over 10,000 stocks and ETFs seamlessly is all embedded into the platform. And in the coming weeks, you'll be able to link your brokerage account, share your portfolio to maximize that credibility when you're writing about those various stocks and ETFs and presenting your theses, both bullish and bearish. And also, it'll allow you access to clean your portfolio with their various analytics tools. I myself have been using Inverse for quite some time now, and I absolutely love it. So come join me and follow me on Inverse at Green Candle IT and join the Green Candle Investments group there. And we can interact, post your ideas and podcasts and what have you there. And we can all have a nice discussion around the financial markets. Now, let's get into the episode. What's up, everybody? We're back with another edition of the Macro Insights Podcast. I want to thank everybody who has been listening on the Podcasting 2.0 app, specifically on Fountain. If you listen on Fountain and you stream me stats or you boost it, I really appreciate it. Um, and feel free to leave me a little review or a little boost there, uh, and I will read it out in the show. So I want to shout out Wedge, so- Wedge Social for saying he loved the geopolitical conversation of the last episode. So shout out to Wedge and boosting me some stats. Um, And then before we get rolling to, I want to say that if you have anything to spare or anything like that, uh, I've been kind of shouting this out in almost every platform that I've been on um, in this past week, but the victims of Hurricane Ian um, could definitely use some of your donation. I'm going to put that in the show notes. Um, They, uh, you know, the foundation there, they'll, they're using the money to help provide people with shelter, food, water, that kind of stuff. So feel free to send a donation if you got it. Uh, but on a lighter note, I do have a very special guest. He's also in Tampa with me. So he uh, fought through the hurricane uh, with me as well. So I got Rod Alsman. Rod, how are you doing today? Brandon, I'm uh, doing a lot better than the folks in Southwest Florida. So I, I echo what you just said. Definitely. If you haven't had an opportunity to donate, you know, some people's livelihoods have been wiped out. And, uh, you know, we, we are fortunate here in Tampa, the storm shifted, but unfortunately that impacted them. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, yeah, like, like we said, you know, if you guys have something to donate, I'm going to put it in the show notes, um, both on YouTube and in audio. So feel free to just kind of scroll down or click on the notes and click on that link. If you got anything to spare and every dollar counts for sure too. But, Um, Rod's a very special guest. Like I said, he's the managing director of Wook Capital and the co-founder of GMEDD. But let's get into you. Uh, So tell us a little bit about your background and, uh, you know, kind of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, definitely not your typical path to my current position. So I'll I've always been interested in financial markets. I was a nerd growing up and took, you know, AP econ classes in high school and participated in the Fed challenge, got to go present Fed policy recommendations as a senior in high school to New York Fed. So uh, I I studied accounting in undergrad. I went to state school for undergrad and grad school, went to Binghamton. Nice, uh, nice time to go there this time of year. Not so nice if you go there in the wintertime. Um, I got out of New York after undergrad. I, I spent 
six years working at Bank of America and a variety of different roles there, not on the banking side per se, more on sales, ops, uh, analytics. Um, but after six years there, I uh, had opportunity to attend University of Florida for my MBA. Uh, competitive strategy was what I focused in there and had a great post MBA uh, path where I joined Ryder, which is a big transportation and logistics company, um, ticker R. <laughs> I worked there for five years, most of the time in corporate strategy, and it was fantastic. I got to work very closely with the C-suite in our annual board uh, presentations for strategic plan. Uh, got to work on a lot of competitive intelligence projects over my time there, put together uh, kind of a company-wide competitive intelligence debrief and and stream. So had a lot of fun kind of learning how to analyze things, um, uncover information um, during that time. Uh, while I was at Ryder, you know, in 2018, I started to get active on social media as it pertains to investing. And, uh, you know, you mentioned GMEDD, which was the culmination of years of research into GameStop. Of course, everyone remembers January 21 with GameStop, but before Jan 21, there were many years of, uh, you know, this, both the stock price and uh, other detractors, you know, very vociferously telling me how wrong I was about my investment in GameStop. So, um, yeah, 2018, I got on stock twits and 2019, I started talking on, I think, Twitter as well, Seeking Alpha, a lot of these other social media platforms. Just and my, my thing was, what am I missing? I want to understand different people's perspectives, right? I, I understood the mainstream headline of, oh, this is just Blockbuster, but I wanted to understand more deeply, you know, what what deep analytics are you uh, looking at? Are you, you know, what news are you consuming that's informing that viewpoint other than just regurgitating kind of a, a, a mainstream headline or talking point? Um, so over the course of 2020, myself and many others, right, we were locked at home. We, more people were engaging online. Uh, I met a variety of people through through 2020. Um, Keith Gill, uh, people know him as Deep Fucking Value or Roaring Kitty. In August 2020, I started to be one of the you know, regulars on his YouTube streams in the chat uh, using my UberKicks11 username. I eventually revealed who I was, uh, but it was only a couple dozen people on there. And it was very tight knit little group of people who were just analyzing what's going on, talking about the stock. Um, you know, people obviously now he has, you know, millions of people aware of who he is, but, but at that point in time, nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew he was also Roaring Kitty and DFV were the same person, which was fun when he revealed that on Christmas of 20. Um, but I also met John Kim. John is the chief investment officer and founder of Wook Capital. And uh, John was one of the largest individual shareholders of GameStop. Uh, he and I spent many, many, many hours talking about GameStop during 2020 and, and 21. And, uh, you know, our relationship developed over time. And um, that brings me to, you know, to cut out all the fun with GameStop in Jan 21. That brings us to 20, you know, Jan 2020. Uh, two, excuse me, where uh, John's founded this private investment fund, and I now am in my current role as managing director there. And our our novel thesis hinges on this idea that we can scalably recreate the magic we experienced going against the grain with GameStop and crowdsource research effectively in ways that uh, you know the internet has enabled, of course, and it's not a new thing, but that I, I think has shifted uh, post COVID. And while there will probably be a mean reversion, uh, I think retail engagement and interest in doing this sort of deep due diligence is uh, going to be with us for for some time to come. So so you know, happy to talk more about Wook Game GameStop part, but that's a, I think a decent synopsis of what brings me to today. Yeah, for sure. Um, but let's let's bring it back a little bit farther. So do you think I mean, you said you you had like always an initial interest for economics, you took AP econ in high school and everything like that. Is there something that you can kind of point to that, you know, really, I guess, drove you that way was maybe a, you know, a family member or, you know, maybe a young mentor or something like that, that kind of told you like, hey, you know, this, you know, this is what I find interesting about econ. And, this is kind of how markets work that kind of drove you to there? Or do you just think it was just almost like a natural inclination? Well, I am naturally very much uh, 
you know, I put on my Twitter profile kind of the, the Gallup strengths finder stuff, you know, strategic ideation input command competition. And I'm somebody who just simply enjoys absorbing information and finding out new things and thinking about ideas um, and being strategic about it. Right. Uh, my father, certainly from a putting me on to at an earlier age than many, you know, investing, um, he'd set up custodial accounts for me and my siblings. I was 13 or 14 when I bought my first stock, you know, I wasn't able to do it myself. I said, dad, Hey, I want you to do this for me. So, so there's definitely some of that upbringing being fortunate enough to, to have a family that was aware of those things and, and made me aware of it at a young age. But I, I remember reading the social studies textbook in you know, middle school. I, I was that kind of kid. Uh, so, so I, I've always been a glutton for information and, and trying to understand things and trying to think long-term about things. So, so, you know, I, I had that fortunate benefit of my upbringing, but I, I think a lot of that's innate. <laughs> Yeah, I gotcha. And I mean, it makes sense. Sometimes people just have like a natural inclination of things and then, you know, it brings them to where they are, you know, long term, which is awesome. Um, but then, yeah, let's get into the GME DD because I, I'm looking at the account here on Twitter. And I think the most glaring, interesting part of it to me is that you guys created all this in April of 2016. So, you know, you said it, it, it was years of research. Uh, so, I mean, I guess what early on struck you about GameStop that, you know, you guys, you know, cr created this account and then obviously it all came to fruition, you know, early 2020. Um, but, uh, you know, what what kind of drove you to that stock and what kind of things did you see? Sure. So just the account was created in 16, but GMEDD wasn't created until uh January of 2021. So, so to, to talk about my initial interest in GameStop, maybe talk more about the, the collaborative research research portion of it. I, I got into it in late 2017. My view was that this is more of a value stock. Uh, it, at that point, it was still generating pretty solid operating income. It paid a hefty dividend. It was facing both cyclical headwinds, right? You have a gaming console cycle. GameStop inherently is uh, selling PS, PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo devices, and the accompanying software, accessories, et cetera. So uh, I had the viewpoint that this company has m much longer than just you know a couple of years. It, it was, at 2017, it hadn't been formalized yet the new consoles would have disk drives, but by 2019, that was publicly known to, to the market participants. Mike Burry kind of talked about that in an interview in Barron's in 2019, that people are getting it wrong. They think it has you know no life left in it. And I had a view that it has at least another console cycle, if not more. So as time went by, you know, a lot happened with GameStop. They did a strategic review in 2018 that they concluded in 2019. They ended up selling off their non-core assets in 20, early 2019. And they brought in new management in 20, in March 2019. They hired a new CEO. The company then, I think, had some really fascinating things happen. You know, I learned a lot watching this all in real time as sentiment ends up just being the driver, sentiment and flows in the very short term drive things, right? So GameStop slashed its dividend to zero after it concluded its strategic review. And it wasn't from any form of solvency crisis. It was from we're, we're restructuring how we think about this company. We have actually a, a whole lot of cash from the sale of the spring mobile business, the cell phone retail business. Um, but zeroing the dividend led to outflows of dividend funds, right? Any institutions or, or even retail investors who owned the stock due to the dividend, right? That it was a, I call it a long squeeze. The stock went from you know, 16 and early 19 down to under $4 by the time August rolled around. And I always tell this story. I was on vacation in, a, in Hawaii with my family and I was buying January 21 GameStop call options uh, at the money and one strike out of the money, uh, literally a couple days before Mike Burry wrote the GameStop board and basically said, hey guys, you can buy back 80% of this company's uh, market cap with your existing share authorization, share repurchase authorization. And you know, from, from late 19, really through 
to August 20, it kind of bounced around. There was some wildness. There was a proxy war where uh, it basically... <laughs> the institutions lent out all of their votes. Um, there was some Wall Street Journal reporting on it at the time, you know, that found, you know, the borrow fee right was uh, over 100% at, at points annualized. It actually went over 200% annualized borrow during that proxy event. And, you know, only one eighth of, of the institutional shareholders ended up voting. And the activist won, got two board seats. Uh, later on that summer, Ryan Cohen gets involved in August of 2020, which sets things off to the races as, uh, uh, as it puts more eyeballs on it. But it was still only a you know, mid single digit stock. It was you know, sub $300 million market cap. And it actually traded at a discount to the you know five bucks a share in net cash it had on its balance sheet at times. So you know, to me, GameStop was my lived experience of how powerful sentiment is in shaping things. Obviously, it's a very different story when we look at you know post Jan 21 uh, and in 22 it's it certainly perceived very differently than it was at that point in time but um, that kind of led me to again in 2020 being stuck at home engaging with more people um, trying to parse out what's happening you know we found I found that you can really uncover some interesting nuggets of knowledge when you're engaging with people online. Uh, the initial Ryan Cohen 13D filing had a renowned M&A specialist lawyer on the filing. I didn't know that until I found in a Seeking Alpha comment, you know, on at the bottom of some story that that somebody made that point that Chris Davis is is a top tier M&A specialist. This this is not just a guy, you know. Um, buying some shares on a whim, it seems like there's probably something more serious to it. And as the story evolved, you know, what ended up happening, as I mentioned, I, I was in the Roaring Kitty chat, uh, that a lot of us were trying to understand and share information as best we could. Um, a chunk of us went on to Reddit and we were in a Reddit chat kind of talking together. Eventually, and I think it was uh, November, December timeframe, set up uh, a, a Discord with two dozen of us, let's say, that, that had been kind of discussing this actively, John among them. Um, and, and we kind of let, laid the groundwork for what became GMEDD in Jan 21. And, and what was GMEDD? It was us grabbing all of the crowdsourced research that we'd been working on myself for years, some people for months, but all of the data, all of the SEC filings, all of the you know, un, un, you know deep nuggets we'd uncovered. Um, we put that together. And in Jan 21, when Citroen had come out and said, you know, here's five reasons why GameStop's going to go back to 20 fast after it had jumped up into you know, the $40 range. We laid out a case for why we thought that in a base case, actually, net of all the information, this is after Ryan Cohen had a settlement with the board of directors, we had a viewpoint that $80 per share actually was a reasonable base case based on the depletion curve of video gaming as we come into the new cycle, based on expected changes in the business. Um, a bull case, we laid out you know, a meme-worthy $169.42 price target. And literally within two weeks, the, the mania happened and ensued. And, you know, we, we had no way of knowing that that was going to happen. But I, I do proudly uh, believe that our work gave people a lot of conviction in knowing that people that have worked on this for many years. I left out the part that I actually, in December, basically reached out to a few dozen investors who, who I'd made, uh, you know, relationships, built rapport with over the years, and, and basically said, hey, look, you know, in December, the board had done this uh, $100 million shelf offering at the third quarter earnings, and it was just a one of the worst earnings calls I'd ever listened to. Uh, for my job at Ryder, I, I got to listen to many, many transportation logistics earnings calls, and this GameStop earnings call third quarter was just trash. It was garbage. It was like these guys had thrown in the towel. So I, I thought to myself, you know what? Cohen's involved. Let's let Cohen know that he has the support of serious retail investors. And I gathered up. 4% of shares outstanding. Uh, John's shares represented the biggest chunk of that and, and went on to become the foundation for Wook, of course. But it was many other just retail investors who I built this relationship with over the years, wrote him this letter. He never responded. His lawyer confirmed receipt of the letter. I, I like to believe that lending him you know, that additional support helped him to reach a settlement within two, three weeks of me sending that, right? Uh, but it, it certainly was my first experience with touching shareholder activism in a sense. It really got me craving more. Obviously the 
uh, you know, I, I had a life changing wealth uh, realized through the Jan 21 mania that, you know, has, has set me in a, in a great position, but I want to kind of share my knowledge, my experience and, and keep learning and getting better as an investor. And that's kind of what's you know led us to Wook. But uh, Jan 21, yeah, that, that was some crazy times. Yeah, for sure. And I was just like looking back right now to just see the chart kind of shoot up and it went from like, it was less than a dollar at, at certain points, like right before all the way up to over 80. So uh, absolutely insanity. And it's just kind of crazy to, you know, actually like interact with you who was at the forefront of all this. And you know, I, th I think, yeah, yeah I, I got to record odd lots with Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway Thursday, January 28th, while GameStop was making all time highs, you know, you noted the chart, which they did a four for one split. So at that point in time, it made new all-time highs of $480. And I, mm. on air, during the recording, sold 420 shares of GameStop at $420.69. So it's like, I, I couldn't have written that story in, in any world, you know, just a few weeks earlier. So it was an absolutely insane experience. Yeah, that's awesome. And then, yeah, you know, you get the soundbite of Roaring Kitty on, uh, on everything too and just saying i'm not a cat and everything like that it was just like it was just a wild time but um you know i i think uh you know that also led you to what capital right so kind of like what you're saying now is like everything has kind of led you to this new new spot so you know what are some of your goals with what capital are you guys trying to find maybe the the next game stop or, or something along those lines i mean of course everybody wants to find that it's just like you know, it's almost like Bitcoin, right? Everybody wishes they invested in it, like when it first started. So, um, like, tell me the goals behind it, and like, kind of some of the work yeah. that you guys are doing right now. Yeah, it, the big thing for us is, you know, I talked about the work we did in what became GME DD, and and all of this was from people who who are not professional investors. These are people who have real regular day jobs. They might be professionals, they might be blue collar workers, but they have a side interest uh, in, in investing. And for me now, it's given me the opportunity for investing to be my full time gig. I'm I'm working with John and managing a, a, you know, a nine digit portfolio and we don't have outside investors that we have to worry about. We don't have to worry about chasing short term performance. And we, we have a pretty unique opportunity where you know, John's novel thesis is this idea that we can collaborate with people like we did when we were just, you know, small nobodies, and we can continue to collaborate with investors. We want to create this scaled information network. I know a lot about transportation and logistics. I don't know a lot about almost everything else. So building this knowledge network where we're being transparent, honest, we're providing tools and resources to investors. You know, we don't need a penny from anybody, thankfully. We are not selling a product or service. We don't have to, and we're fortunate in that regard. Um, longer term, we want to do philanthropic work as well, but at its core, we need to be good investors and we need to prove that we are good investors and we need to realize alpha and realize returns. But we have a view that through collaborative crowdsource research, you can actually achieve alpha. Um, you know, I think about with GameStop example, for example, you know, did, yeah, I mentioned these nuggets of knowledge. I became aware in October of 2020 that you could actually tell how GameStop's e-commerce order numbers were performing simply because I was a consumer of their products. I looked, I, I was looking at my um, app one day and saw, you know, these numbers look like they're sequential. And I'd never seen anyone on the sell side talk about this. I did have a hedge fund reach out to me after I started publishing my work that noted they had also picked up on this. Um, that hedge fund ended up making, it was reported, I think $700 million on their GameStop trade. But you know, it, 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 uncovering these, these incremental pieces of information that don't show up in SEC filings that give you an informational edge. And then I began just sharing a kind of the back of the envelope model. Okay, I knew that there were this many orders. It looks like the quarterly rate is trending for this. So I started sharing that on, on Twitter and stock twits. People started just sending me their order numbers. So, so I was able to keep building out the model. And, you know, that's not unique to GameStop. Obviously, that's a consumer facing brand where you can kind of get that edge um, and other, you know, it's not to say that that's, you know, that big of an edge, right? Like in, in the long run, you need to have more than just that. But, but those sorts of uh, you know, 
incremental insights that people can bring to bear because they're just looking in different places than other people are. You know, I mentioned the lawyer example. So, so we're still pretty early on. Um, we've started to produce some social products uh, at four o'clock today. We're actually going to be doing our third Wookin review where we're going to be talking about uh, what's going on with Elon and Twitter, kind of a lay of the land with the EV landscape. Obviously, he announced the semi is finally entering production, maybe, possibly, uh, with Pepsi. So, you know, it's all about making people see value in being part of this community we're looking to foster uh, and understanding, you know, we're not asking for anything. We're, we're going to provide this. If you see value in it, you'll join and you'll participate. And we think that we can create something that's unique because I don't know of any other private investment fund that's that's doing something like this. And we don't know that it's going to work. So there's certainly risk there. Um, we're willing to take that on and, and we're going to try to be agile and adept and, and learning as we go. Yeah, for sure. And uh, for those listening, he said that, uh, you know, you guys are going over that. What did you say at three o'clock or four o'clock? Four, yeah. Four overlap with your 4.30. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, that's uh, so this uh, episode, we're recording it on Friday the 7th and it's dropping on Monday the 10th. So uh, I believe uh, will, will we be able to like go back and look at it on YouTube or something like that? Yeah. So we're, we're going to have it recorded. We finally, you know, this is fairly new to me. I've never done you know, streaming stuff really, but we, we finally layered on some visuals. Uh, we have a YouTube that we'll have it uploaded on after the fact for folks who can't join live that'll have audio and video. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll link that in the show notes as well for those that want to tune in and everything like that. But um, you know, I think on a broader scale, this whole, you know, GME fiasco, um, whatever you want to call it has, like you said, has kind of brought on the exchanging of information um, you know, whether it's, you know, Wall Street bets, other Reddit, uh, subreddits, I've even seen some more platforms, you know, Inverse is a sponsor of the show, um, you know, and, and a lot of these others that are kind of focusing on that collaborative, you know, retail investor market. Do you kind of see this as, you know, like you said, I mean, obviously, you guys are starting Wook Capital. Um, and I think, like, yeah, like you said, I think you guys are the probably the only private, um, I guess, investing um, whatever you want to call it, like portfolio that uh, is using this kind of strategy. Do you think that this is going to be, I guess, more popularized in the future? Um, or do you think this is going to be kind of like uh, maybe like Wook's niche and more, maybe more on the retail side? So, so I would say while we, we certainly are focused on the retail side, I wouldn't preclude if an institutional investor wanted to participate. And obviously they're, they're, Become questions of compliance and disclosure, and, and I understand that. Um, I, I do think there's a lot of white space. You know, you think about it like a blue ocean strategy, right? It's there's this like you would inherently think that well, if I'm sharing my best investment ideas with other people, you know, I'm losing my alpha, and you know, I, I just don't think that you know, with what we've observed over the last two years, three years, that that the strong form efficient market hypothesis. Uh, I, I think it'd be hard for people to really stand up and defend that. Um, I, I genuinely do think there's a lot of room for people, whether it's inverse, Wook, others, you know, there's so many different channels people can tune into. And I think that's what it is, right? We are an incremental channel. Uh, hopefully one of the valuable ones that people will find provides access to a variety of different experts over time uh, across a variety of sectors and that can ideally glean and, and uncover nuggets of information that people are missing. And that's not to say others won't and, and don't find them, but I really think that limiting your, your analysis to just the SEC filings, for example, is is inadequate, is insufficient, right? Everybody, you know, who who has access to a Bloomberg terminal or or any internet uh, access worldwide can tap into all of that public information. And and it's not to say that the stuff we're uncovering is is you know MNPI or anything, but it's like it's going a step further, I think, than just what's you know listed in an in a 8k or or in a 10k or a 10q and whether it's do, you know boots on the ground research and looking at a smattering of you know if it's a consumer company looking at what their inventory levels look like on the ground obviously hedge funds do all this stuff at scale they you know they tap into satellites and and they have credit card data and, and it's not to say that that there will be you know an edge in that regard but I do think that the, that it's kind of this nuanced way of saying that more and more and more eyeballs and 
brain power uh, from different backgrounds and lived experiences on on different uh, securities can can yield that alpha. And we'll see how it plays out. But I do think that that trend is unlikely to reverse, right? The barrier to entry for anybody to invest, as we know from Robinhood, no commissions. Obviously, that's great from a trading and transacting perspective, but access to knowledge, access to expertise, you know, Twitter spaces, right? Brandon, you host these and I've tuned in several times and you get people who know things that you would never have come across in your, your experience because uh, you, you just don't work in that industry or in that sector, or you don't see that on a regular basis. And, and getting access to worldwide expertise across a variety of topics, you know, Twitter spaces, obviously Clubhouse has kind of gotten knocked out by them, but you think about these different platforms, I don't think we're gonna revert back to a world where people are um, you know, uninterested. We certainly will probably see less of the speculation and outright gambling that happened during uh, peak COVID times. But I do think that investors are more interested than ever and, and will continue to trend that way. Now, do you think that that, you know, that investors kind of being curious, doing their own research and kind of getting into that was accelerated uh, due to, you know, COVID's people sitting at home and all that kind of stuff. And then also, you know, obviously the influx of capital, right? Like with the stimulus checks and everything like that, it seems like everybody was kind of, like you said, almost gambling and putting it into the stock market or doing something to try to, you know, find that edge, find that alpha. But it seemed like, you know, from an outsider's perspective, like kind of coming in, um, that a lot of people just, you know, were, were like, all right, this is going to make me some money. So they were just throwing darts at the wall. And maybe some people got lucky with GME. It seems like you guys did a, a, a ton of research and, you know, you obviously published all that. But, um, you know, do you think that that's uh, a trend that's going to continue? Or do you see like the retail investor getting a little bit more sophisticated just because of the access to, you know, like you said, like the Twitter spaces, the sharing of information and other things like that? Look, there, like with everything, there's a spectrum. And you know, I really enjoyed your broadcast last week because the guest, you know, Piotr noted that there's a lot of nuance with, with many of these things. And on one end of the spectrum, you have people that you know, have a view that markets are rigged and that they're, you know, there's some social justice campaign that they're now involved with and that AMC is, 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 you know, whatever. And, and some of these other, you know, meme stocks, right. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, of course, you have very serious retail investors who maybe they don't engage in social media today. Um, maybe they're just starting to become aware that I could get some incremental information by engaging in social media. So like, I definitely, don't want to disparage any investors. You know, I, I would characterize the people on the, uh, you know, that me, me end of the spectrum less as investors and more as speculators, right? They're not, they're not, they're not buying a business, right? And maybe some of them are, but by and large, they're not looking at an operating business and saying, this business is going to generate these returns. These are why it's competitively advantaged. These are why it's going to, you know, sustainably return in excess of its cost of capital over blah, 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 whatever duration, like they don't need to have, they don't have that mental model. They're not thinking about that. Some of those, uh, I think newer investors, and I hope as time goes by and they don't get discouraged by, you know, maybe losing on, on bets in financial markets and they realize there's more to it than just making short-term bets on price. Um, right? Because price is not a business and investing is actually, you, you think about like the Warren Buffett's the world who say, you know, think about you're buying a portion, a share of ownership of this business. And if, if you weren't able to sell, you know, for five years, 10 years, uh, you know, would you be comfortable with that? And if the answer is no, you're probably just making, you know, a short-term bet on price. You're probably speculating, which is to say there's anything wrong with that. Um, there, there's certainly opportunities to, to make those sorts of bets. And, and it's, you know, it's like, it's like poker, right? You're making a probability adjusted bet based on the known information you have. Ideally, you have the best information and the right information. You're never going to have all the information. Um, but that's, I think, what we're going to hope to do is educate people more on different ways to glean information, right? Uh, when I was at Ryder, competitive strategy was one of the, my roles during my time in corporate strategy. Um, competitive intelligence. So it's like uncovering what competitors are doing, um, trying to identify industry trends and where thing, you know, where the puck's going, as Gretzky would say, right? So trying to give people ways of thinking, improve that, um, and, and make make them aware it's not just a you know a crapshoot, right? They're they're actually, and it's not a zero sum game either. Investing is not a zero sum game. Um, you know, maybe a short term trade in the sense that somebody bought it at this price, somebody sold it at this price is a zero sum transaction, 
But when a company sells shares of stock, you know, in an IPO or, or in an, an incremental, you know, at the market offering, something like that, they're taking that cash from the investor and they're investing it to get a return. And that's not zero sum. So I think helping to educate on that front, helping to um, provide different tools and resources, since we do have the, the financial capabilities to do so, to give retail investors access to things, you know, whether it's a Bloomberg terminal, whether it's some different um, subscription services that, that, that may be out of reach for some of them. And we're looking to do all of those things. But as I said, at its core, really, the idea with WOOC is building an information network and trying to scale that up and recreate this research process that we enjoyed with, with GameStop. Yeah. And I see it's, you know, like I said, I think that just the sharing of information is, is awesome. And I think it's going to continue, you know, like I said, I think like a lot of these, you know, like look and other, other these platforms are continuing to grow and, and scale and, and more people are getting access to it. Um, but, you know, we are in kind of, uh, you know, some, some difficult times, uh, you know, whether we're in a recession or not, or inching close, um, you know, it's neither here nor there. Regardless, the, the market is not doing very well right now. And we're, we're seeing some, you know, obviously there's places in, in, at all times in the market to make money and, and do other things like that. But, um, you know, I did see a recent stat that um, of the accounts that opened up in 2020, um, I, th I believe like uh 30 percent or so i don't quote me on this exact but i remember it was like a significant chunk like about a third uh had closed that account and of those people that closed that account i believe like 40 percent were millennials and so it is kind of discouraging to see that a lot of people you know did kind of come in and then maybe they they ran into that but uh you know what would you say to i guess somebody who's kind of dealing with uh maybe that that first, you know, kick in the mouth or, or something along those lines where it's like, okay, I'm losing paper money essentially because they're, they're not selling or they, they get the, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of stressed out dealing with the volatility that's kind of in the market now that's, you know, somewhat unheard of, but maybe for somebody that's just been putting money in a savings account, it's, it's new to them. I, I remember blowing up a trading account in the great financial crisis. So I would say there is value in blowing up an account and, and maybe, maybe it's a negative financial value, but the life experience is, is certainly invaluable. Um, I would hope that those people don't get discouraged by uh, financial markets, you know, moving against them in the short term. I, I think it's really, that goes back to the conversation around the difference between, you know, are you saving and investing or are you just, you know, trying to make bets, trying to get rich quick because, while certainly there were many people who did just that, um, that that saw you know GameStop in Jan 21 and, and rode the wave and exited and entered at the right points in time. You know, as I mentioned, for me, it was a culmination of a multi-year investment thesis that took hundreds, if not thousands of hours of my time and energy and really was part of my life deeply enmeshed for, some, for, for, for most of that. Um, I, I would say... Understand that it's a very long game that you're playing. If you're 20 something years old, you know, I'm 33. I'm, I'm not that much older than the folks who, who might not have lived. And I was, I was an undergrad still when the, the GFC really hit hard. So I was fortunate not to be graduating that year. Um, you know, the class of 09, right. Had it really tough. I was class of 2010. Um, but, but kind of I'm reading the psychology of money right now. And, and as Morgan Housel really astutely points out, your lived experience as it pertains to finances and, and life in general, really, even though that's 0.0001% of, of all uh, outcomes, you end up thinking that's the norm. And I think it's important to step back and really try to listen and read and ingest information from various sources, older folks, peers. Um, you know, if, if you are an older person, listen to younger people as well. Um, you know, if you're an older person that fully discounts blockchain, right, you're probably missing something. Um, it's it's more about the pattern, right? Saving money, investing on a regular basis, as opposed to, you know, just taking it all and putting it on black at the casino. Because that, again, that's not investing. Um, you know, compound interest, right, is I think Einstein is often attributed, you know, the, eight, the most powerful force in the universe, whether it's a real quote or not, it's a fun one. You know, it, Warren Buffett 
what is it? He accumulated the vast majority of his wealth after his you know, 65th birthday or whatever, you know, after the point most people would be retired uh, just by virtue of compound interest. So starting early, if you are in your 20s, if you're diligently saving, whether it's a Roth IRA, right? I can't give anybody targeted advice, but I would say you need to consider uh, optimal location of your assets. There's many ways to do that, um, whether it's a health savings account. If you're a young, healthy person and your employer offers that option, that's a fantastic vehicle to leverage the Roth IRA, the 401k, you know, all of those things. And it's like, I remember talking to a friend who was like, I don't want to put my money in a 401k. I want it now. You know, I'm, I'm in my you know late twenties and I'm like, yeah, but your, your, your 60 year old self is going to really appreciate it when, you know, that however many hundred dollars a month that you're socking away grows over decades into you know hundreds of thousands if not millions so trying to take the long view uh not getting rattled by you know short-term gyrations obviously you noted correctly it's a very uh frightening time in financial markets you know we've already experienced a meaningful drawdown for many folks especially if you're in long duration higher risk assets um if you're looking at you know, blue chip assets right the mega cap tech titans have have broadly not yet returned to earth, some of them. Uh, you know, you look at Apple and you look at where it stands compared to pre-COVID, you had a lot of demand pull forward for a lot of things. Like how many laptop computers does one person need? How many iPhones does one person need? People obviously talk about it on the durable goods side, you know, the furniture side of things, right? Um, you know, people spent a lot on that during COVID. People had stimmy checks and were buying a lot more goods they couldn't spend on services. So the market is always going to be super noisy right now. Everyone is obsessed with the Fed and, and you know, you need to be aware if you're going to try and actively be making moves in and out. But if, if you're a long term buy and hold investor, actually, that stuff's really irrelevant to you. You should be monitoring your companies if you're investing in individual equities rather than indices, which look, there's nothing wrong with, with getting the market return in an S&P index fund is, you know, Buffett notes for most people, that's the right way to go. Um, understand, you know, what is your duration, right? If it's, if you're old and close to retirement, you probably don't need to be all in Carvana. You probably want to uh, be in some bonds and treasuries and you can actually get a return now in short-term cash-like positions. So there's, there's so much to consider. I mean, I, I'm, I'm such a nerd with this stuff. I've, I've read so much about it for so many years. I'm always so happy to share what I've experienced. And I'm, I may be wrong, but at, at the minimum, I think that that spirit of information sharing is something I, I love that I'm seeing a lot of from younger people. I think it's something people are more willing to talk about in our generation, um, whether it's you know their income and their expenses and how they should be managing it. Uh, you know, talk, having those conversations or maybe something that wasn't as popular or common by I think older generations. So long way of saying, yeah, it's, it's frightening out there. There are very real risks in the global economy. Uh, but if you are investing in blue chip companies, you know, and, and it's not to say you shouldn't invest in long duration risky assets, but, but you certainly need to size appropriately. You need to consider that in the context of a broader, well-diversified portfolio, right? It's, it's I would say it's pretty imprudent to be you know, all in on one security. Um, you, you may be that certain. You know, I think it was uh, Howard Marks. One of his Marxisms was, um, you know, a gambler went to their horse track and he bet the rent on this one horse because it was literally the only horse in the race. And what did the horse do? It jumped off the course and got disqualified. So, you know, there's there is no such thing as a sure thing, right? It, you are inherently taking risk. If you are investing in equities, more risk than you would as a bondholder or in a cash-like instrument. So yes, your opportunity for return is much higher, but you, you need to understand that by, by taking on that risk, you are opening yourself up to, to downside. And that's not to say that losing money is the, the end of the world. You're going to see drawdowns, but it comes down to how you've positioned yourself. What's your duration? What are your goals, objectives, your personal circumstance? And, and all that stuff gets super complicated and m people will be better off at least talking, you know, more so about this stuff with, with friends and family and potentially professionals. But, uh, you know, I, I'm all about making this less of a, oh my God, we can't talk about this um, because you know, everybody, everybody can stand to benefit from more open discussion and discourse. Yeah, and I agree 100%. But that also leads me to the next question is like, how, there is a lot more discussion. So how does somebody kind of getting new into, you know, the financial markets, 
kind of this this uh, maybe uh, not dissect, but you know, defer between good information and bad. Like, how do they yeah. determine, you know, who to listen to, who not to? Because I mean, you know, like you said, there's you know, obviously the Warren Buffett school of thought, and you know, value has been kind of getting crushed lately. I mean, I think maybe you know, my personal opinion it might roar back or whatnot, but. Um, you know, there's there's like a lot of voices out there and, you know, you're seeing uh, Jerome Powell trend on Twitter every time the Fed uh, has a meeting, you know, CPI is being printed. You're seeing it all getting, you know, all yeah. these Twitter spaces popping up, people talking, thousands of people in this room, in these rooms. Um, but, you know, like you said, well, at the end yeah, the what's real and what's noise? Yeah. It's, it's definitely a challenge. And some of that is is learned. You simply need to expose yourself to a vast array of viewpoints and sources. Um, you know, it's not to say that one source is, is, is truth and one is false, but you definitely, when I, when I was working competitive intelligence at Ryder, you know, you'd have a press release from a company and then you could look at five plus different, you know, trucking related websites that would, dig into the story and maybe one of them has a really nuanced quote from some expert in the space. So like it is quantity. Yes. Over time you suss out quality. And when I say it's quantity, you know, you're, you're trying to tap into as many sources as possible, but, but it's not just because that person has more followers or less followers. You know, a lot of, I think people uh, incorrectly assume that just because someone has a bigger audience, they must be more correct. And I don't think that's true. Uh, they often, it's kind of a self-reinforcing thing, or maybe they've, maybe they've got better marketing or uh, they've bought some of the, you know, that exposure, whatever it might be. But, you know, it comes down to, I think you have a big funnel at the top. You try to get from all ends of the spectrum information over time, whether it's you yourself or, or from feedback from from others uh, can suss out which of those sources maybe you can narrow it down to. You can kind of have your primary, like I know this is a reliable, good source of information. Like for me, I have certain Bloomberg newsletters that I read diligently, Wall Street Journal newsletters that I read on a daily basis because I know they're going to cover the vast majority of things that I really want to be aware of what's going on in, in markets and in the economy. And some of them are fantastic writers and I genuinely enjoy reading their writing. So, So there's all of that. And then it's reading things like books. I mean, you've got some brilliant people that will, you know, invest months and years of their life cataloging these thoughts in crisp, concise messages. And, you know, I know John, my CIO, he's always like reading is a superpower. You're able to get all of this benefit from these people who've done this for years, decades, whatever, and are willing, you know, are sharing it with you for you know, the price of the book or whatever. Um, and uh, that that just gives you so so much for so little, and you get a great return, I think, on your time with some of these. And just going back to the question, though, which books are good and which aren't? Sometimes, just because a lot of people said this book is good, it, it's not. Just because it sold, you know, two million copies, it, it may not actually be valuable. So it is a balancing act. It's it's definitely all about, I think, having a wide funnel, having an open mind, being willing to say, I don't know a lot about a lot of things because we are expected to know everything or think we know everything. And we should in fact acknowledge that we've oftentimes know very little. And unless we are a true industry expert on a, on something, we probably know less than we think. So it's definitely about trying to find the true experts, which definitely takes time developing that skill uh, and, and trying to be open to as many viewpoints as possible. But you're right. There's a lot of noise out there. Uh, the mute button is fantastic. <laughs> uh, you know, whether I remember I would always say on stock twits, you know, just block out the noise when we we're talking about GameStop before the channel became completely inundated with, you know, bots and spam. It was actually good back and forth conversations and threads with people. And, uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll find there's, there's a lot more people out there that, that are lurking than you think. Um, and, and I think just being a good faith actor and, and being open-minded uh, will lead you in the right path. Yeah. And I, and I agree with that too. You know, I think it, it takes time and, you know, I think at the end of the day, just finding as many sources as you can and kind of critically thinking out of it on, on your own as well uh, helps a lot, you know, not just strictly relying on some other people, just seeing like re really your own opinion. Like, does it make sense to you what they're saying? Uh, not kind of taking, you know, people's word as Bible or, or what have you, uh, whatever expression you want to use there too. So, um, but 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's interesting the way that things are things are moving, and you know, I kind of alluded to it as well. Like the you know, the overall market conditions right now are you know kind of iffy, a little choppy. So, how do you see this? You know, current market. Um, you know, obviously, you don't have to make like yeah. super drastic predictions or anything like that, but in a general sense, you know, how are you overall feeling about the current market conditions and where we're headed? Well, look. The Fed funds rate is going to continue to rise. Um, you know, there's every day you hear a different person say they're going to pivot, they're going to pivot, they're going to pivot. If you listen and you've been listening to the Fed you know, this year, obviously things played out differently than they had hoped over the course of 21 and early 22 in that supply chains did not fix themselves. You know, whether it's chip shortages for the automotive space, whether it's plastics. Um, you know, shortages that, that also impact automotive and impact other industries, you know, all of these kind of supply crimps did not uncrimp in time and the Fed found themselves, you know, slow to react. And, you know, it, it, with hindsight being 2020, I think they can acknowledge they should have acted sooner. But at this point, they're playing catch up. They've done three 75 basis point hikes. I think they will, and the market is pricing that they will do another 75 basis point hike and then a 50 in December. And that brings us to a Fed funds rate. You know, if your risk-free rate is four and a half percent, five percent, let's say the 10-year treasury gets to gets there, you, know, you it's really going to be a headwind for valuations. And, and when you think about companies who are generating long-dated cash flows, those cash flows become even less valuable. Um, so, so I do think that the growth and technology space is going to continue to face that. Uh, obviously, there could be a pivot, right? There could be a black swan event at any point in time. The Bank of England had to step in due to what was going on in the gilts market. So you know, quantitative easing to prevent markets from completely imploding. I think that central banks have made it clear they will step in if need be. But then when you look at valuations and you step back over, you know, a multi-decade duration, you look at, okay, yeah, p price to earnings ratios don't look crazy if you look at the current estimates. But I think that a lot of those estimates, then you need to step back and look at earnings. You look at, say, S&P earnings, and you look at how elevated S&P earnings are for 2020, 2021, even 2022. And you look at then that the estimates for 23 are still, you know, flattish. Uh, people haven't really realized perhaps that um, I, I think you will see, look, an earnings recession, right? A decline in earnings is is going to happen in my view. Um, that doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean an earnings depression, but when you have corporate margins at all time high levels, um, you know, cross industries, you had you had until you know this past year valuations getting back up toward late 90s you know tech bubble levels obviously that froth a lot of that froth has come out but i think when the pendulum swings from extreme it doesn't usually stop in the middle so it's entirely possible that we get back to a regime where earnings come down and multiples c could come down further especially if risk free rates remain elevated so if you're buying you know again for a multi decade duration all this stuff's noisy for you. But if you're trying to be tactical, y yes, if you're buying indices, you know, right now, that that seems pretty risky given where we know the Fed is going and where we where valuations still stand. But if you're looking at individual companies, I don't think you should be scared that just because, uh, you know, the macro is slowing down and things are scary, you need to understand that individual company's risks and, uh, and rewards. So I I'm still a buyer of, you know, I own British American Tobacco is, is one of my largest individual holdings in my personal account. Allison Transmission, uh, is those two are my two largest holdings and their value plays. They generate a lot of cash. They, in my view, are misunderstood by the market at large that has a view that they are maybe in terminal decline. Um, but I have a differentiated view similar to you know GameStop. So I may be wrong, but it'll take years to prove that out. At least with both of those stocks in the meantime, I'll get paid a dividend. BTI has a nice seven plus percent yield right now. Um, the risk, uh, reduced risk products space is growing. Eventually it becomes a growth story actually, uh, something like BTI, because even though cigarettes are in decline, 
the smokeless uh, and whether it's oral, whether it's um, vape, uh, whether it's, you know, heated, not burn, that stuff, right? Humans have used nicotine for millennia and it's a highly regulated space. So you're likely not seeing new entrants come in. Um, the, dis you know, the, the big multinationals that own distribution that are, are moving into the reduced risk products, you actually get a larger customer lifetime value because your customers live longer. So, so there's stuff like that, that maybe on its face, you think, oh, you know, tobacco, dying industry, cigarettes, nobody does them anymore. Well, I think there's nuance to that. Just like with Allison, people think, oh, electric trucks, right? Semi that Elon announced last night is finally coming into production. Um, Allison makes automatic transmissions for commercial vehicles. If it's an electric one, you don't have one. Now they have a foray into that space, but there's big question marks around what do they, you know, how do they play? Um, I have a view that Commercial vehicles, based on my experience at Ryder uh, and having worked in corporate strategy, you know, for there for many years, that commercial vehicles will be quite slow to electrify for a variety of reasons. So it's a differentiated viewpoint that I've developed over time based on a lot of work and personal knowledge. I could be wrong, right, in both of those examples. But I do think there are pockets of opportunity. I think generally, all else equal, you should be looking at companies that have competitive advantages that are not valued out of line, right? If you're paying a, you know, if you're paying a price to sales multiple in 2022, you're probably not going to have a good time, right? Um, so, so understanding, you know, the unit economics of these businesses, trying to understand that a little bit. And look, there's nothing wrong with stepping to the sideline and saying things are so jarbled right now. I'm going to earn 3% risk-free in, you know, an FDIC insured savings account before I can decide what investments are interesting to me. Yeah. And that's great. And I think that's a, that that point is just absolutely, you know, you know, a, a great outlook. And I think everybody who's looking at, you know, the markets, it really depends what kind of investor you want to be, right? You know, whether you want to be long, short term, whatever, and that kind of affects like, these short term things. But, you know, at the end of the day, there's going to be some news article, some headline that, you know, something that Jerome Powell says that's going to, you know, cause the market to react, you know, maybe irresponsibly in the short term. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it just really depends on your outlook. And, you know, the longer your outlook, the, uh, I guess, less stress and less, uh, you know, less weight you can hold on a lot of these things. But Rod, you've been very generous with your time. And uh, I, uh, you know, deeply enjoyed this conversation. You, you're a wealth of knowledge and uh, maybe we'll have to grab a beer or something down here in Tampa one day. But uh, why don't Definitely. you tell me? Yeah. Why don't you tell everybody uh, where they can find you and what you got going on? Yeah. One last thought before I add those things is is to the point you just made, uh, uh, you know, if prices do keep falling, you know, if you're a younger investor, this is a gift. You're you're buying these companies and, and if you're really investing in them, you have a very long duration. You're getting better internal rates of return on your invested dollars, the lower these prices go, right? Assuming the company doesn't you know, go bust, which again, that's always a chance. So, so I think younger investors shouldn't be overly scared, you know, especially if, if you're making, you know, you have a paycheck and you're contributing, you know, dollar cost averaging, um, you should, you should welcome being able to buy companies that you have a long-term view on at, at better prices. But um, you can find me on Twitter at Rod Alsman. You can find Wook Capital on both Twitter at Wook Capital, as well as we have a Discord that we've started up that we're looking to get, welcome really anybody who wants to join the conversation, wook.gg. You can join the conversation there. So uh, yeah, thank you so much, Brandon. It's a great conversation. You know, As you can tell, I, I can get on a run and I love talking about this stuff, very passionate about it, super interesting. Um, so I, I'd love to get you know grab a beer some, somewhere in Tampa with you. Yeah, for sure. We'll have to do that. And we'll have you back on at some point down in the future as well. So Rod, thanks so much. And I really enjoyed this one. Thanks, Brandon.